At this stage, let me um, say a few words about where are we as a global community from an institutional perspective? Where are we at the global level in uh, moving towards better preparedness to pandemics? Are we drawing the lessons? So, st starting point I already mentioned is that despite warnings and past lessons of SARS, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, the world was not prepared to COVID-19 because we're going into these cycles of panic and then neglect. And to repeat myself, I do think we are in a phase of neglect again at this time. Last year at, the, um, at this conference, where do I have to press? Can I have the next slide? I have trouble. Thank you. The next one, or press again. Okay. Last year at this conference, Ambassador uh, Anders Nordstrom, um, who was part of the independent panel on pandemic preparedness uh, and response, of which I, I was also privileged to be a member, talked about the six main recommendations that came out of the independent panel work uh, to the international community. One is the need for sustained high-level political attention and leadership. We have lacked strong leadership and coordination in our response to COVID-19. The second is modernizing our surveillance and alert system so that we can respond much faster to uh, infectious <clears throat> outbreaks in the future. The third, as El Storelli discussed, is to build a new platform that will ensure equitable access to all in need to medical countermeasures. The fourth, and thank you Minister Barakat for mentioning that, is that we need new funding we need new funding, funding for pandemic preparedness and response. Fifth, we need a strong, independent, well-funded, well-functioning World Health Organization. And six, at national level, all governments must start investing in better preparedness now. And following what Antoine Flao said earlier, one of the obvious areas of work is improving ventilation and quality of the air. The next slide. So at the global level, there are three out ongoing processes out of the four that we had been recommended as recommending as an independent panel. The first is that for the first time in history, a special session, high level meeting on pandemic prepar preparedness and response was held at the uh, UN in September 23, in the margins of the uh, last uh, General Assembly with a political declaration. Uh, I must say that uh, this was a high-level meeting, but it was hardly attended by any <coughs> high-level head of state. Uh, and none of the European uh, major heads of states was there. No Chancellor Scholz, no President Macron, no British Prime Minister, no Madame van der Leyen, no one present, which to me is a strong signal of, of the phase of neglect where we are. Minister Barakat, we met in New York, so you were there. Uh, congratulations to the UAE. Um, the second is that we have now started um, negotiations in Geneva since February 2022 of a new pandemic treaty, a treaty that would be a binding treaty according to international law. And this is negotiated under the auspices of WHO. You may know that in the constitution of WHO, there is room for negotiation of international treaties. The first one that WHO had negotiation, negotiated was the International Convention on Tobacco. Third, there is a more technical process 
of revising what is called the international health regulations, but that is a very, very sensitive negotiation because this is where we're discussing about where, how countries will inform the world about uh, new pathogens and also whether WHO will have or will not have the ability to move to a country and investigate a new outbreak in case it happens. The fourth, which is not currently in discussions, is that we had proposed that there is a global health threat council established something like a security council on threats, so to elevate the issue of leadership. As we were discussing with uh, Madame Barakat, um, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres, came with an alternative uh, suggestion a few months ago, suggesting that the UN creates, next to the Security Plat uh, Council, a platform on all threats that are, let's say, non-military, uh, food, water, climate and health. And that will be discussed at the Summit of the Future uh, next year. Next slide. So the big issues, next slide please. The big issues at stake in these discussions are governance, the topic of this conference, financing, and in terms of financing, we need financing in order to prepare ourselves to the next pandemic. We also need surge financing in case something happens. And then, as else alluded to, we need to build uh, regional resilience so that in every region of the world, there is now an ability to develop research, manufacture, and distribute global common goods that are personal protective equipment, oxygen, vaccines, therapies uh, that are essential in containing an infectious outbreak where and when it occurs. The next slide. As we speak, the latest draft of the pandemic treaty is on the table in Geneva and there are four very sensitive issues that are being debated. One is access to pathogens. You may know that in 2007, during H1N1, Indonesia said that it will not communicate the sequence of the virus to the global community because, and I make it simpler here, they said if we give this sequence to the world and then it serves, the rich country industry to produce vaccines that will be sold to us as at unaffordable prices, then this is unfair. So there is a, a lot of discussion now in the pandemic treaty this negotiations around whether country should always give free uh, sort of uh, um, access to their path the new pathogens or whether a country that provides the information should have benefits uh, from that information. Then there are major debates around medical countermeasures, as uh, Els uh, Torelli alluded to, including the sensitive issues of intellectual property, of research and development, modalities of technology transfer. There are discussions about financing Financing pandemic preparedness is a global issue for everyone. So we all agree that everyone should contribute to funding pandemic preparedness, whether you're a rich country or a poor country. But of course, with so-called differentiated responsibilities, and that's what is difficult to define in the negotiations. And finally, WHO had suggested that it could come up itself with a system of providing equitable access of countermeasures, vaccines, therapeutics uh, to the world, and that is uh, being negotiated. I don't think at this time that it is likely that these negotiations will come to an agreement by the deadline of May 2024. More time will probably be needed, but viruses don't wait, and that's the problem. 
Let me add an optimistic note here, which is that whatever the challenge is, there is a, a word that is everywhere, every day in the negotiations, which is equity. And I think the main lessons uh, that everyone has been drawing from the pandemic is unequitable access. And now we need to find a system that would guarantee equity. Next slide. Now, as in every negotiation, uh, now the geopolitics are there. And uh, the difficult negotiations that we're currently witnessing in Geneva show how closely health is now intertwined with geopolitics. And particularly between the tensions between the global north and the global south. Your Holiness Bartholomew, you alluded to that in your speech, talking about the fact that they occur so strongly despite the diversity of the South. I think I'm quoting you here. And that is what we're seeing. Vaccine nationalism, the fact that the rich countries overbought all of the vaccines as they became available with no access to poor country has really left profound scars that we see in the negotiating uh, scene uh, in Geneva. And then, of course, there is much less trust at this time in the multilateral system and then domestic, uh, international, but also partisan uh, political agendas has somehow forcefully entered into the global health discussions Think of the attacks on WHO by President Trump and his administration or the misinformation campaigns from the uh, Bolsonaro team. So that unfortunately, uh, the pandemic and health uh, is no longer the one issue that brings uh, countries together uh, in those negotiations. It's in fact contributing to the polarization of our geopolitical uh, world. Uh, next slide. So what is clear now is that uh, global health, as I put it, is a matter of global politics. And that is why, Thierry, we need global health in the WPC uh, as you uh, allowed it to, to, to happen. Because the pandemic at national level has impacted every sector of policy making and therefore at national level it is no more just an issue of ministers of health it's an issue of whole of government and at global level it's an issue that is negotiated now at the level of heads of states ministers of finance ministers of trade ministers of development it's a key issue at the G7, we will hear from Aruka in a minute, at the G20, it is on the agenda of the UN General Assembly and all regional organizations such as the African Union or the European uh, Union. And it's become particularly an important interface between health and foreign affairs. And I think it is remarkable that in the UAE, we have a minister uh, an assistant minister of health uh, and research within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the next slide and the last slide. The question is, are we ready for the next pandemic? To me, the answer is no, we're not. But it is our choice uh, if we want it to be so. It's a choice now to put in place measures that will allow us to identify new outbreaks rapidly and to respond to them in speed where and when they occur and prevent an infectious outbreak from becoming an epidemic or becoming a pandemic and becoming a social and economic catastrophe such as the one we've seen. And to, para to quote here Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President Sirleaf, who was the chair of the, in the, with Madame Clark of the independent panel, she said, new pandemic threats are inevitable, but pandemics are a political choice. The political choice whether we stop a, a, an outbreak or whether we let it move to the pandemic stage. Let me say, 
uh, I think the ongoing processes, however difficult they are, offer an unprecedented opportunity now for the world for focus and transformative change. Thank you.